Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we're in topic number 20. We're dealing with healing the sick. So we have healing the sick, and then the next lesson we have is raising the dead, then casting out devils, and then we're going to talk about the Great Commission. So the last four lessons of the curriculum, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and the Great Commission. The last four lessons of the curriculum are very important for one reason. This is your practical application. So here's what I want you to take. Take everything you've learned so far. Salvation, baptism of the Holy Ghost, tongues, gifts of the Spirit, intimacy with God, knowing God's voice, all the things that deal with grace and faith, all of the things dealing with kingdom finance and parable of the sower and trees in the garden and the names of God. Take everything you've learned and now it's time to apply it. The last four lessons are the practical application of what do I do now? Now, let me say this. Before I get into the actual lesson today and we go through this, I want to encourage you to get prepared on what your next steps will be. The last four lessons are very practical, but I want you to have next steps in mind. Take the advanced curriculum. Learn the truth of the bridegroom revelation and the fullness of God. Take End Times Curriculum Part 1 and Part 2, which is the revelations of God's end time story, especially with the things that are going on right now in the world. You need to be prepared for that. Take divine purpose. How do I walk out my purpose? And what are the truths that allow me to walk in my purpose to its fullness? There's a lot of things that we have coming later that you can take that I encourage you to take after this curriculum to give you a fullness of revelation when it comes to these truths. Now, I want to say something before we get started in this. I have a PDF on your participant tab called Additional Outside Resources or Outside Resources or whatever it's titled. For the last four lessons, I want to give you this piece of encouragement. If you are going to study these more in detail, you're going to study more about healing the sick or more about raising the dead, or more about casting out devils, or more about you know the actual Great Commission and walking it out, study under the people that have the best results. It's always been my encouragement. If this person says, God doesn't heal and never gets a result, and this God says that God does heal and has a 90% success rate, or even if this guy says it does but only gets 20% healed, but this guy gets 90% healed, then listen to the guy that's got 90. He's obviously doing something different that's causing results. The same thing with raising the dead. If this person doesn't believe in it, doesn't get any results, or even if they believe in it, but they've only raised one person from the dead, seen a thousand people die, one person raised, versus this guy that's got a hundred people raised from the dead, listen to the guy that's got better results. And the reason why I say that is people that have better results usually have little tweaks in their understanding of the narrative. They, they, they have deeper revelation according to the word of God. You know, you pray, you don't get results. I pray, I get results. It's because I'm doing something different. I have a different understanding. I have a different revelation. It, it, you may believe, but I may just have a deeper understanding of it. That's why I get better results. I've always believed that and I will continue to say that. If you want to study, you should study under the people that get the best results. You know, if this guy does it better than this guy, then I would study under the guy that does it better. And one thing I will encourage you about the, the names, and I'm about to mention a couple names. It's on that PDF too. But every name I'm about to mention on who I would encourage you to get more information on these are very practical. So because they're very practical teachings, we only have an hour for each lesson. These guys have been teaching this for 50 years, 40, 30, 40, 50 years. They taught these truths. You know, they have millions of people healed, hundreds of people raised from the dead, thousands of people set free from devils. I mean, they get some of the best results. And that's who I encourage you to study under. But I encourage you to study under people that do one thing. They have no respect of persons. Meaning they don't believe that I can, you can't. I have some special gift. I can do it, but you can't. No, every single one of the people I'm about to tell you their names, they believe not only 
is it applicable for them to do it, but you can do it also. And all of their teaching is a way in which they reproduce, meaning I can heal the sick, you can heal the sick. If I teach you what I know, you can do what I do. And that's the people that I encourage you to study under. Study under the people that can equip you to do the work. So, let me say a couple names. If you're going to study healing the sick, you study under Curry Blake at John G. Lake Ministries. Now, this it's all under the uh, on that PDF in the participant tab. So, you don't have to write this down. You can just go and pull it. Curry Blake at John G. Lake Ministries. They get the best results when it comes to healing. I don't know another ministry personally that gets better results than they do. So if you want to learn healing, you learn through them. They have a divine healing technician training manual that can actually give you even more. I mean, they have thousands of hours of teaching on healing the sick. And they have healed hundreds, thousands, millions of people. They have healed the sick. I mean, they get the best results. So that's who you want to study if you want more information on healing. I know there's other people that do it, but these are the best. And that's who you want to study under. If you want to learn about raising the dead, obviously, Curry Blake, because they also heal the sick, they do raising the dead. That's a good person to listen to. But my personal encouragement would be David Hogan. Brother David Hogan. It was five or six years ago, he had raised over 60 people from the dead. He gets great results. I know people that have healed one or two. This guy's healed over 60. He has an understanding of how to make it work. He knows how to do it. That's who I would listen to, David Hogan. Curry Blake's raised the dead. Andrew Womack has raised the dead. And I encourage you to listen to both of those people also. But if you're specifically going to study raising the dead, you study Brother David Hogan. Casting out devils. If you're going to learn more about casting out devils, You study Brother Summerall, Dr. Summerall. He had the best results. The devil that he cast out of the the woman in the Philippines called it a nationwide revival. He has the best results on the demonic side, casting out devils. He has some of the best teaching I have ever heard on uh, uh, demons and deliverance, principalities and power, angel entities. All of those teaching on how to cast out devils is by far the best I've ever seen. We have cast out devils. Pers- I personally have cast out devils out of people. But after studying under Dr. Summerall, his teaching on that, it has made it so much easier. You know, we've done it before, but I have been able to do it like that. One prayer, one command, anywhere, anytime. There's no, it. you know, we're... The first time I cast a devil out of somebody, it took me three hours because I didn't know what I was doing. Now I can spake one command and cast any devil out of any person. It's that easy. Because Dr. Summerall gave me so much more understanding. So that's the people I encourage you to listen to. Curry Blake, if you want to know about healing the sick. David Hogan, if you want to know about raising the dead. And Dr. Brother Summerall, if you want to talk about uh, casting out devils. I also encourage you to listen to Andrew Womack. Now, we are partnered with Andrew Womack in the Army Ministry, the Army Network. And Andrew Womack has done all three. Heal the sick, cast the devils, and raise the dead. He raised his son and his wife from the dead. So, I believe Andrew Womack has some great teaching, and they get great results too. Uh, These are just like the four main people that I would tell you. Curry Blake, Dr. Summerall, Brother Hogan, Brother David Hogan, and Andrew Walmack. That's the four ministries I would tell you to listen to if you want any more teaching on this. Because like I said from the beginning, all four of those people teach in a very specific way. They teach the authority of the believer, the way to get results, and they believe that anybody can do it. There's a lot of people that teach these things, but they believe they can and you can't. These people believe that they can and you can And they teach you how to do it and they have replicated results. Meaning they've reproduced in other people. They've healed the sick. The people that they taught healed the sick. The people they taught healed the sick. I raised the dead. You raised the dead. The person you teach raised the dead. That's what they do. And so that's the people I encourage you to listen to. I just always like to give some additional information because we've got four hours to teach through these lessons, but these guys have 
I've listened to all of them for hundreds of hours a piece. I mean, each one of these people I've been studying my almost my entire Christian walk, I've li been listening to these guys, and they have amazing teachings. It's what's equipped us to do what we do now. We heal the sick. We have cast out devils. I have not got a chance to raise the dead yet. Lord willing, we'll get that opportunity and we will raise the dead. But we've seen the power of God and we have been truly blessed by those faithful men and women of God. We're not trying to be the only one, us four no more. We're trying to work body with body, working corporately together to get results. So that's my little encouragement from the beginning. Now let's pray and let's get right into it. We're on page 125 of the curriculum. Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, let's read this first passage. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged him on a tree. Him God raised on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now, who's speaking? Peter. Peter is talking right here. Who is Peter talking to? He's in Cornelius' house at Caesarea. He's at Cornelius' house. Why is it important to know where and to who he is speaking? These are Gentiles. They're not Jews. Peter's preaching the first sermon unto the Gentiles. That's what's happening. Peter went outside of the Jews to preach to the Gentiles. First ever time. We always think of Paul who preached to the Gentiles. Peter did it first. Peter was first. This is the first time that it had ever been done. The very first message that Jesus preached, or that Peter preached about Jesus, Jesus healed all who were oppressed of the devil. Sickness is oppression of the devil. Sickness is the devil oppressing somebody. Now, we're not talking about, oh, you're possessed of a devil because you're sick. No, sickness is on your body and it needs to be uh, cast out it is not the will of God it is never never the will of God that you be sick never you're like well God gave me sick no God did not give you sickness God is light in him is no darkness at all God does not contradict his character if by his stripes you were healed if you were healed you is healed it's bad English but it's good Bible God healed you. God didn't make you sick. It's one or the other. He cannot contradict himself. So if he says you are healed, he never says you are sick. Which means sickness is a consequence of sin. It is a consequence from the devil. It is against the will of God. And it is the role of the believer to enforce the victory that Christ paid for. When Christ said you are healed, our responsibility is to enforce the healing. And to remove the sickness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, what spirit lives on the inside of you? The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Ghost. Now, two things. I'm pretty sure it's in this curriculum but if it's not i'm just going to go ahead and say it jesus healed all 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 means all people are all the time like well jesus didn't heal everybody jesus healed all every single person he encountered he healed them all well they're like well it's not written down if you read in the end of the gospel of john john says if i wrote down every single miracle jesus did and i wrote it in a book there would not be enough space in the entire world to be able to hold the books, which means from here all the way to the sky, all around the world would not be able to hold the books written of all of his miracles. That means he, the miracles wrote in the Bible is not the only miracles he's, he did. 
The reason why the miracles are wrote in the Bible, he healed that sickness, he healed this sickness, he raised that dead, he raised this dead. He gave a blueprint. If he could do that, then he could do anything else. He did that as a, what was wrote down was the blueprint. He healed everybody. This isn't one time he healed somebody. This is an example. He raised the dead. This was an example of him raising the dead. He cast out the devil. This is an example of it. The Bible gives us examples, but it is not everything he did. It's only some of them wrote down as examples because we know that if he did that, then he did the rest. That's the part I want you to understand. Just because it's wrote down doesn't mean he didn't do it. Just because, because the Bible declares what is wrote down is that he did do it. He healed everybody. Well, they're not all written down. doesn't matter. That's why they said he just healed all of them. Here's one example, but he healed everybody. The example shows you how he did it, why he did it, exemplifying the character of God. And then they just said, well, everybody else was done too. So if I got to write this down, I've got to write down a million here. You know, I've got to write down a million healings just from this one encounter. That's what was being said here. But what I want you to see is that it says that the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you. Now, here's what I want you to get. The power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Now, listen. What is the greatest miracle ever, ever? There is not a single person who has a resurrected body yet, except for Jesus. Jesus is the only one with a resurrected body. The saints and them that are judged to the lake of fire have not, nobody else has received a resurrected body yet. The only person that has is Jesus. So the greatest miracle ever to take place Ever, Christ Jesus raised from the dead, that's the greatest, which means everything else is less than that. Jesus raised from the dead, okay, healing cancer, opening blind eyes, deaf ears, everything else is of a lesser degree. And if the power and the faith that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is in you, you have enough faith and power right now to heal any sickness or any disease. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can stand before the name of Jesus. It must bow its knee. And you have the power to heal anything. There is not a single sickness, single disease, single devil, single dead person that will not obey when you speak in the name of Jesus. I don't care what it is. Well, that dude's been in a wheelchair for 10 years. Who cares? I got the power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, which means I got enough power to raise that man up out of a wheelchair, heal that little boy from cancer, open that man's deaf ears, cure those blind eyes. You have enough power in you to do it all. There's nothing that you can't do. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you because you have the power of the living God on the inside of you. You need to hear this exactly like I'm telling you. And I'm telling you this straight because there's so many people that believe I don't have enough power. I ain't got enough faith. Well, what about this? What about that? And Jesus is just going to look at you and say, you have everything right now to heal any single person and to cure any disease. There is nothing that you can't heal. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the Sea of Galilee and through the midst of the coast of Decapolis, and they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impenitent speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him, and they took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, spit and touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Apapatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain, and he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And beyond measure astonished, saying he had done all things well. He, bake, he maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Now, what did Jesus do? Put his fingers in the ears, spit and touch his tongue. He commanded them to be open. Listen, he touched his ears, he touched his tongue. The act didn't do anything. That's not what 
opened it. It's when he said, be opened. That's what did it. I want you to understand healing the sick is this easy. Command it. Speak what you want it to do. Cancer, go in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be open. Be loosed. Just say it. It is the command that heals. He'll say, well, what about the oil and this and that and the other? We'll get to those, but I want to tell you, the actual act, touching the ears, touching the tongue, anointing with oil, this, that, and the other, those are for the other person. That's not for me. If I anoint you, that's so you know you're anointed. That's because you are a carnal believer. Or maybe you're just a non-believer. Doesn't matter. Those things are not what heals the person. What heals the person is the command. We'll also see in a minute, believers lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. You don't even have to pray. You just have to lay hands. But I want you to see commanding is the way in which people get healed. Now, what did Jesus tell the people to do? Tell nobody. You ready? But then they did it. You ready? Sin did not cause them to lose their healing. Jesus prays. Or Jesus commands, you know, prayer is just a directed discourse. Commanding is a type of prayer. But he commands. The guy gets healed and then goes back into sin. You ready? He doesn't lose his healing. That's a sacred cow. People are like, well, sin prevents people from getting healed. Sin didn't prevent this man from staying healed. He got healed and stayed healed. Living in sin. We talk about sin as immorality, drunkenness, this, that, and the other. Well, if you get, if you live in sin, you'll not get healed. No, that's wrong. Jesus gave this man a direct... God looked him in the face and told him not to do it. He did it anyway. Yet that didn't stop his healing. That didn't take his healing from him. He still was healed, even if he was in sin. Is he ready for this? Sin is not a hindrance to being healed. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee and entered into a certain village. There met him ten men that were lepers, stood afar off, lifted up their voices, and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself unto the priest. It came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, We're not... Ten cleansed, but where are the nine? And there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, how many did Jesus heal? All ten. All ten were healed, but only one turned and gave glory to God. Strangers are more likely to glorify God. You know, it's you know, you go into the church and it's it's the people outside of the covenant that get healed that tend to glorify God more. But the thing that I want you to see is Jesus expects everyone healed to worship him for their healing. You ready for this? Healing the sick is to bring glory to God. That's the part I want you to catch. Jesus healed every single one of them, and he did it for glory back to God. And we glorify the Son to glorify the Father. That's what Jesus expects. The miracle power of God Healing the sick, you ready, is not for your promotion. It's not for you. It's for God to get glory. So, if you're going into churches and doing this, that, and the other, and going on the street, and you're laying hands and people are getting healed, it is not, I'm not saying you can't video it and put it out there for God to get, but if you are doing it for your own promotion, listen, you'll know this because it's in your own heart. If you're doing it for you, you're wrong. Healing, now, it's a good thing that they're healed, but I want you to understand, many, many will say, Lord, Lord, did I not do these things? And Jesus say, I'll never knew you. It's not about doing it for you. It's about doing it for God to get glory and for people to come and worship the Lord. That's why we heal the sick. We don't heal the sick so we can get a bigger ministry. We heal the sick so people will get born again and people will bring glory to God. That's why we do it. That's why we get good results too. So Jesus came into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. 
And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, and he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, and he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The noble man saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word of Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. As he was going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And he inquired he of the hour where he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it had been the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. This again is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, what did Jesus do to heal? He gave a word. Your son is healed. Go thy way, thy son liveth. He spoke in faith. He commanded it. Thy son liveth. He released life. What part did the nobleman play? He believed. He received. Listen, if you want to stay sick, you can stay sick and die. But if you want to believe, just receive the word and you'll be healed. How long did the nobleman have to stay in faith? Jesus spoke until the next day he got word. Jesus said, your faith. And he had to believe. He had to go believing. And he had to stand. Listen, the moment you speak, it's done. But you have to keep believing, even if you don't see it. The nobleman hadn't seen it, so he had to keep believing. Now he's seen it. He doesn't have to believe for it. He sees it. He's got it. He received it. But he had to believe all the way to the next day, even though it was already done. I want to tell you, when you pray and you command, it's done right then. Even if you don't physically see it, it's done. You said it, it's done. Well, I pray nothing ha- It's done. Believe that you receive when you speak. Quit contradicting yourself. If you say, well, I did it, and then I don't see nothing happen, you contradicted yourself. Let, that, let not that man think that he shall receive. Quit going against your confession. Quit going against your prayer. Say it and shut your mouth. Be healed in Jesus' name. And then shut up. Quit talking. It's done. I just said it. I believe it. It's done. Don't. People say, well, what? There is no other. Speak it. Command it. And just stand on it. Simple as that. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay out of the spittle, annoyed the eyes of the blind man in the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. Then brought the Pharisees to him that aforetime was blind. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made clay. He opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him, How had he received his sight? And he saith unto him, He put clay upon my eyes and I washed and do see. Now, what do we learn about Jesus from generational sin and healing? Generational curses do not affect healing. Well, I've got this curse. Doesn't affect healing. Generational curses are paid for at the cross of Calvary. There is no curse, no sin that you are under when you get born again. When you get born again, the curse is broken. The curse of sin, all these... Gen- well, this happened. That my, my family, my, my uncle had to wear glasses. My mom had to wear glasses. It's just a curse that we can't see that well, so I've got to wear glasses too. No, that's a lie. You were delivered from the power of the enemy. You don't have to live like that. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. The Bible declares that you aren't under sin and under curse. Delivered from the curse. Jesus did it on the Sabbath day. Understand that healing is not a work. Healing is for every day. It's for every day. Anytime, anywhere, any place. And it's not a work. You don't have to earn it. It is a gift of God given unto you by the cross and what Jesus did on Calvary. What part did the man play? He went to the pool and washed. He heard and obeyed the word. He had to receive it and believe it. 
I tell people all the time, you can pray for somebody to get healed, but if they don't want to get healed, they will stay sick. You know, it's, it's, I don't want it. Now, unbelief is very different than rebelling against, like, I don't want it, which means I don't receive it. It's very different than I don't have the faith to receive it on my own. Unbelief cannot stop faith. If you pray, no matter what they believe, they can't stop it unless they don't want it because God will not override somebody's free will. What did Jesus face after healing? He faced persecution. I want you to understand, not everybody will receive you even if you're healing. That man was sick. He got healed. Still got persecuted. You will face, a lot of times, persecution even doing the will of God. He'll say, why? Because religious leaders don't always want somebody to get free. You know, people that are in bondage need somebody. You know, the religious leaders don't always want somebody free. People that are oppressed of the devil, the masters of them don't want them free because that's how they get money. You need me, so you always just keep giving. It's a form of oppression. But also, if they can't do it, they want to see to it that you don't do it. Envy, hatred, stuff like that. Man, we got a lot to go. Let's keep going. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If that wall thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was clean, and straightway charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and said unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, and show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them, But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places and they came to him from every quarter. How did Jesus heal the man? He touched him and he commanded, laid hands and said it, be healed. He told the man afterwards to show yourself to the priest and tell no other man. What did the man do? He told everybody. He immediately disobeyed the son of God. He he disobeyed God. Sin does not affect your healing. I want you to see that. You need compassion. And it is always the will of God. Jesus said, I came to do the work of God. I do what I, I say what I hear my father speak and I do what I see my father do. So if I do it for one, I do it for all. It is always the will of God to heal the sick. It's always the will of God to heal everybody. And it's done through compassion. You got to have compassion. If you have compassion on people, it's against the will of God. God doesn't want that person sick and it moves me. Compassion moves you to take action, to do what is necessary to ratify the situation. Remove the sickness and heal the sick. Jesus entered into Capernaum and there came unto him a centurion beseeching him saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grieve and tormented. Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus heard it and marveled, and he said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And I say unto you that this man shall come from the east, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed in the selfsame hour. What did Jesus do to heal the servant? He commanded the servant be healed. He spoke a command. Now, what's important about this scripture? The greatest faith is to believe in authority. To believe in the command. To believe in the authority of God. Jesus' authority is what healed the man. The centurion was faith-filled to believe that Jesus could do it with just a word. Only speak and it'll be done. Jesus said that is the great faith. When you say be healed, authority is what is the greatest faith that brings forth healing. A centurion woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians... Spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be whole. 
And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude throng thee, and they say, Who toucheth me? Looking round about, see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And she, he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, how did the woman with the issue of blood, she touched the garment of Jesus. She pulled the power out of it. She received. Her faith got her healed. Her faith. Believing, connecting herself to God is what got her healed. Being connected to God is what gets you healed. There is faith that reaches out and takes healing. It appropriates it, just receives it. The miracle, because power flowed, but it was not in accordance. Jesus didn't have to lay his hands. He didn't have to pray. He didn't have to command. She just pulled the power right out of him. It's a miracle. Now, he entered again into the synagogue. I'm going through these kind of fast today because we don't have enough time to, to really just go through these very little in detail. That's why I gave you those additional people to study. We're going through this kind of fast. We still got you know another two pages to go. He entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for their hardness of heart, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. How was the man healed? He gave a command. Be healed. Stretch forth your hand. What do we learn about the heart of the Father? It is always the will of God to heal on any day at any time. There is no hindrances to healing. None. The only thing that hinders people from being healed is you believing that there's hindrances to healing. If there's no hindrances and you say and it happens, it will just that way. Be it done unto you according to your faith. What you believe. Jesus never had any hindrances. What makes you think you do? There's no hindrances to healing. Zero. And they departed from Jericho, and a great multitude followed them. And behold, two blind men sitting on the wayside, when they had heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, what will ye that I will do unto you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. And Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received their sight, and they followed him. How were the men healed? Jesus touched their eyes. What do we learn about the heart position in healing? He had compassion. Compassion moves you. It's not emotion. It's not some feeling of sadness. It's compassion. It's seeing something against the will of God, knowing that you have the power to change the situation and moving and doing it. It's not compassion if you don't act on it. You'll say, well, I got compassion for this, this person or this situation, but then they don't do anything. It's not compassion. Compassion moves you. Even when others disapproves, it is, you, it is the will of God for you to heal the sick. All these other people said, don't, you be quiet. Their opinion doesn't matter. It is the will of God to heal the sick. So don't let anybody stop you from healing the sick. It doesn't matter what other people think. It's the will of God. And because it's the will of God, you can do it. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his mother's wife, or his wife's mother, laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirit with his word, and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. How was Peter's mother-in-law healed? He touched her. Lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. What did Jesus do when the people came unto him? 
cast out spirits with his word, spoke, healed all that were sick. He fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah by healing all of the sick. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the city round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folk, and there they were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. The shadow of Peter was healing people, but they healed everybody. Jesus healed everybody. The apostles healed everybody. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. How are these people healed? Handkerchiefs and aprons, cloths. You pray for a prayer cloth, you lay it on somebody. Faith, the power of God released through the cloth, healing people. Last verse. And this is, the, this is the one I want you to hold deep. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. You were healed. You is healed. Now, let me say a couple of things about healing the sick real fast as we get ready to finish. Healing the sick is always 100% the will of God. For everybody, believer, non-believer, Jew, Gentile, everybody. It's the will of God that you be healed. Sickness does not matter where it came from. They're like, well, was it this or was it that? This or the other? How did this sickness come? And Jesus said, it doesn't matter. What matters is you healing them for God to receive glory. So let me tell you right now, you don't have to know how they got sick. You don't have to know what caused the situation all you have to know is that it is the will of god that they be healed every single person not only is that the will of god you must be moved with compassion which means you must see it know that it's not the will of god know that you have the power to ratify the situation you have the power on the inside of you to heal it and then move and do it it's not compassion if you don't move. It's just emotion. Compassion is not an emotion. Compassion, compassion is a choice. It is a choice to act on the will of God and to fix a situation. That's true compassion. It's not compassion if you don't do anything. And then the last thing I want to say is there is no, zero hindrances to healing the sick. Sin, this, that, the other. There's so many things where people say, well, there's all of these things that hinder healing. Well, Jesus said there is nothing that hinders healing. Zero. Absolutely nothing that can hinder healing. When you pray for the sick, they get healed. The only way that people don't get healed is if they don't want to get healed. Which means they don't come to get prayed for, then they won't get healed. It's a very simple thing. People that want to be sick will stay sick. That's their will, and God will not override their will. But if they want to be healed, there is nothing that can stop them from being healed when you lay hands and you speak in faith. Now, the Bible is very clear. There's many ways to heal the sick. The gifts of healing, lay hands on the sick, the sick recover, commanding by authority and faith, them reaching out and pulling the power. I want you to understand there's every way there's no hindrances, and there's many ways to heal the sick. The absolute best way to get results is the way Jesus did it most often. Put your hand on them and command it. Be healed. Sickness, go now in the name of Jesus. That simple. S speak to the problem. Tell it what you want it to do. Cancer, go now in Jesus' name. Speak to it. And then command healing. Be healed. Listen, Jesus never prayed to the Father about healing the sick. He only commanded the sickness to go and the person to be healed. That's how you heal the sick. Listen, the word from God has already came from heaven. He said heal the sick. You don't have to ask God, do I pray for this person? Do I reach out and touch this person? Listen, God said, if you see sickness in anybody, 
anywhere, reach out, touch them, and heal them. They're, to anybody, anywhere you're at, walking down the street, in the airport, at a restaurant, in a church, if there is sickness, reach out and heal them. That is the truth, and there is nothing that can hinder it. Where they're at, where you're, there is no hindrances to healing. And if you will believe this, you will see the results. And like I said, I do encourage you. Uh, Curry Blake has a powerful curriculum called the Divine Healing Technician Training. Or the Divine Healing Technician or Training. Yeah, if you go take the, the class, it will give you all of this plus so many more details. And I encourage you to take that. We've taken that. We have went from barely seeing any results to walking in divine health and to seeing results. It is a powerful tool and I encourage you to take that also. But there's no hindrances to healing. God wants everybody to be healed. Reach out and touch everybody. There's nothing that can stop the power of God. We're going to stop here for today. If you have questions, send your questions in. But Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day and we will see you tomorrow.